Good morning. My name is Gordon Stedjink. It is not Louis Morel. Louis Morel is the coordinator of this class. I'm the Mike Toter. And uh, Louis out of the country, but he'll be here next week. So I'm here to welcome you all and all of our friends in Hass for visiting us in the virtual classroom. I'll take a second to remind you to turn off the beepers on your phones. That, that will not be an interruption. <clears throat> and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our presenter this morning. Uh, I got a chance to think about Marshall uh, this morning and we go back 65 years. So the, that's one of his uh, problems. But anyway, we have a good time together. And he's a Hope College graduate, class of 1960. He has worked at Brookhaven National Labs after his PhD at Illinois. And he's also worked at Harvard Medical School. He's one of our favorite presenters on science and its many facets in our, our HAST classes. Help me welcome Marshall Elzinga. Yeah, I guess our connections at Hope really were sort of through music. I mean, Gordon was a singer and I was a trombone player in the uh, orchestra and uh, that's where I met my wife Jackie who's our guest this morning. She was a bass player and I was a uh, trom trombone player and so yes we've done music. Uh, I like to say that the only thing we have in common is music. Um, anyway uh, I, I, I need to start with a little bit of a confession. Um, uh, this is really not my field uh, so um, I've had to learn about photosynthesis uh, uh, over the last few months. Uh, a Haas member, in fact, told me that uh, we learned about photosynthesis in junior high. What are you talking about photosynthesis, photosynthesis for at Haas? Anyway, I did take some biology at Hope in the late uh, 50s uh, as part of a standard pre-med program, uh, but it was mostly descriptive stuff. Biology has changed a lot since then. Um, and my bacteriology professor there was Philip Crook, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Philip Crook. You remember Philip Crook? Wonderful, wonderful lecturer, wonderful uh, person. Uh, he piqued my interest in, in basic research. He was the uh, uh, guide to uh, DNA, which was just uh, recently been described by Watson and Crick um, uh, in 1952, I believe it was. And um, uh, insulin had just been sequenced, uh, a small protein molecule. Uh, an important uh, um, hormone. And all had received Nobel Prizes for this. It seemed clear to me that combining chemistry and, and biology was uh, could be very interesting. Uh, it was also just uh, post Sputnik and uh, the US government seemed to realize that investments in science education could help the US stay away, stay ahead of Russians. So rather than medical school, I sought a graduate program, become a research scientist, ended up in the Department of Physiology, uh, Department of Comparative Physiology at the University of Illinois. Uh, over the next several years, with the help from NIH, the National Institute of Health, and the American Heart Association, I enjoyed a 40-year career doing what really what became my hobby, protein chemistry at Illinois, Brookhaven, uh, and, uh, and Harvard, as uh, Gordon mentioned. I retired in 1998 and HASP has been my uh, academic home since then. Uh, I'm not sure what I would have done here without uh, HASP. I moved from, uh, actually we were living in New Jersey at the time, uh, to Hudsonville where I grew up and um, HASP has been the center of my activities. Um, I uh, uh, presented quite a few courses as mentioned on various uh, biochemical, biomedical related uh, topics. 
Uh, but it's been a while, and I have not been in this room before with all this fancy new equipment. So I'm just trying to learn how to use it. Um, but uh, being out of the year, out of the lab for 25 years, um, everybody knows that green plants harvest uh, energy from the sun, make sugar from carbon dioxide and water, and put oxygen back into the atmosphere. Nevertheless, photosynthesis is a, is a very interesting subject. It's been around longer than people, uh, a couple billion years longer than people, and it is the most impactful biological process in the history of the earth. I mean, it really does, without photosynthesis, we would not be here, of course. So I've done a lot of studying about this over the last few years, uh, last few months, and today and next week, I would like to try to help you understand a little bit more about how photosynthesis works and about its impact on our lives. So with that uh, apology, uh, let me um, point out that um, I, I read some YouTubes. One of them um, was uh, sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, you who or began at least as uh, such. Uh, they um, took a microphone and asked a bunch of um, MIT graduates, recent graduates at an MIT commencement ceremony, um, where the uh, wood comes from in a tree. And they really didn't seem to know. Um, they uh, didn't seem to realize that it uh, comes from the air. And um, now if I can figure out and do all these things properly. Um, I have a wildflower garden in my, uh, at my farm. Let me see, why didn't this advance? Uh, that's, this is the MIT one, of course, some nice trees that uh, get their uh, substance from the, out of the air. My wildflowers here at this uh, farm where I grew up in Blendon Township, the barn that my grandfather had built in 19, 1893. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I built a, put in a wildflower garden and uh, if I stand and look at it, I sort of, it hits me that every bit of flower and leaf uh, on that uh, field has uh, all the carbon in it has come out of the air. Um, the uh, question has been around for a while, and some of the, um, uh, you can ask who, in, who actually discovered photosynthesis. I mean, people have been looking at plants for as long as people have been around. But uh, and I'm sure a lot of people were interested in what's going on, and um, uh, not everybody wrote papers about it. Uh, but one of the first papers was by uh, a man named John Baptiste von Helmont, a uh, late 1600s, a, uh, a Belgian physician uh, who did an interesting experiment. He essentially asked, um, where does the increase in the mass of a growing tree come from? Does it come from the soil in which it grows or does it come from somewhere else? So he, um, he did this experiment. He grew a willow tree in a pot um, and he weighed it before he planted this willow tree in the pot. And he grew it there for several years and it grew in, in, and then he took the tree out of the pot, the roots and, and, and uh, leaves and, uh, well, not the leaves, the leaves are not really included I guess they, because they came off every year, but it was, uh, he, he measured the weight of the tree and, and measured the weight of the soil that remained in these pots and found that um, uh, it uh, increased from five, the weight of the, the mass of the tree increased from five pounds to 50 pounds with no change in the, in the mass or weight of the soil. He concluded that the increase of the tree, mass of the tree was due to the water. Uh, and uh, that was obviously wrong, uh, but, um, he took a shot at it. Uh, the next person who uh, we have uh, who uh, addressed it was a Dutchman named Jan Ingenholz, also a trained physician who published this paper entitled uh, Experiments uh, Upon Vegetables. Does this show up on both slides? Uh, experiments Upon Vegetables. And um, he... Um, 
he was he moved to to England and and became a friend of of, uh, of um, Priestley, who was studying oxygen um, at the time. This was the late seventeen hundreds, and they published a um, a paper that that among other things shows this particular experiment, and uh, he. Um, well, He took a bell jar, this is this, this uh, uh, glass thing, and, um, and people do this now in junior high class. They uh, take this bell jar and put it in water, put a candle inside it. Anyway, if you put a candle in this bell jar and let the candle burn for a while, it eventually goes out. And we know now that it's because they use up the oxygen in the, in the bell jar. Uh, but uh, he, they didn't, I mean, they were studying oxygen. They didn't really know it's, it's very good. But he also put a, a mouse in the bell jar and the mouse, all, the mouse died eventually. And, uh, and the conclusion was that, that the, the candle, was, candle was taking something out of the air that both the candle and the mouse needed. Then they did an equivalent experiment and uh, I'm sure they fiddled with it for a long time to see exactly how they would do this, but they put a mint plant in this bell jar uh, along with the candle and the, and the mouse. And they don't describe all the experiments, but eventually discovered that the, the mint plant was putting something back into the into the into the air that kept the candle and the mouse alive, and that was part of their work on the um, on, on oxygen, but also uh, on on photosynthesis. Uh, so the conclusion was that that green plants do something that put something back in the air that that uh, candles and mice need. Um, this is also uh, sort of a uh, summary of it. He was a trained physician in, in Holland. He found that aquatic plants, he also found that aquatic plants like uh, um, um, algae uh, produce uh, oxygen bubbles uh, if you grow them in the water. I mean, you, just, you could do that experiment now. They do produce oxygen. Uh, but that they did it in the light, but not in the dark. And that gave some indication that uh, they need sunlight to produce oxygen. And they, they, well, this is just a brief summary of what they did, but uh, it was a, an important experiment. So what we're really looking at then is photosynthesis. Uh, let's look at this slide here for a little while as well, since this points up, comes up on both of them. Um, here's sunlight on a, on a plant. Um, carbon dioxide comes out of the air, goes into the leaf. Oxygen comes out. Sugars are are, are produced. This shows them coming out, but they actually stay in in, in the plant. And then this shows it uh, the the chemistry of it. I'm not going to go into it very much now because I'll go into it um, at length later. But again, the plant cell with the chloroplast, the light coming in, it has to have water. Uh, it needs carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, produces oxygen, and um, actually it doesn't use carbon dioxide here. It uses carbon dioxide. Um, in in this part, the, the, this this requires light. This half of it requires light. This half can be done in the light or the dark. And in, here's where the oxygen carbon dioxide comes in. It gets incorporated into uh, some pre-existing molecules, and what comes out is uh, is sugar. And uh, that's uh, what we will head toward uh, over the, the next uh, couple of sessions. Uh, the, the other um, way to look at that is to just write a chemical um, reaction. Some people are sort of afraid of chemical reactions. This was is, is very the basic. It just shows carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of the sunlight produces sugar and oxygen. That's photosynthesis. So the sugar, it's technically glucose. Sugar is one, glucose is one of many, many sugars. Uh, those of you who um, do uh, crossword puzzles know that um, the uh, suffix O-S-E always refers to a sugar. Uh, so we have lactose, and we have fructose, and we have glucose, and galactose, and ribose, and so forth. 
Simplest one perhaps is glucose because that's what uh, photosynthesis makes. Oh, man. So the uh, glucose is made by, it's the basis for our food. Um, everything, everything you ate for breakfast uh, was once glucose coming out of a plant. Uh, besides giving us glucose, plants also use glucose themselves uh, to make cellulose. Cellulose is your, your, your um, paper that you're writing on is 90% glucose, 90% cellulose. So that also has come through plants. And so glucose, cellulose is the, is the source of cotton, paper, wood, coal, oil, gas, um, the works. It's pretty important stuff. Uh, so, and, and then the oxygen, all of the oxygen in the atmosphere and in the oceans is, provide, is produced by photosynthesis. Uh, and oxygen is required by most living things. Some, some things are anaerobic, they don't need oxygen, but uh, oxygen is absolutely required by most things that live on Earth. And they are required not only to process food, uh, well, the main thing is to process food and then extract the energy from that food for whatever we do. Um, I failed to mention at the outset that I welcome questions. Um, we talked about whether they should be at some point in the talk or, or, or as, you, as questions come up. So if you do have questions, uh, we have some microphones around so that if you want to ask any profound questions uh, or you can wait for little breaks. Anyway, we need to talk about energy. Energy is the ability to do work. Energy exists in many forms, um, chemical energy, and chemical energy is what's stored in glucose. Uh, thermal energy, uh, it's in the middle of the earth. Uh, some, uh, the Icelanders extract uh, um, uh, um, uh, heat, uh, thermal energy from the earth to heat their homes, but it's there, it's not very usable. Uh, nuclear energy, um, uh, radioactivity, uh, of course, that's used in nuclear reactors, and so uh, that's another form of energy we have. Uh, but the sun sends us sunlight, and which is electromagnetic energy in the form of photons, uh, and um, uh, that's what we use for, for uh, photosynthesis. Uh, so how does it, how does the sun really uh, how, the, the energy of the sun affect the earth? Well, it warms the earth. Yes. I miss some. In the structure of the planet, you know, I, I understand the role of sun and oxygen and outputs of um, part of oxygen and glucose. What is the structure of the planet that enables that? That in, the question is, what's the, what structure in the plant enables the production of, of the, the photosynthesis? Chloroplasts are in the leaves. I'll get to that. Anything else? Um, yeah, so, so the sun has profound effects on the earth, obviously. Uh, it affects weather, uh, indirectly, giving, indirectly giving us hydroelectric power because it, it, it uh, evaporates the water, which then comes down as rain and we get rivers and so forth. Um, the uh, uh, affects the, the weather for, for wind and, and et cetera. So the profound effects on, on, on uh, the um, uh, milieu of the, on the earth. Uh, using solar panels, energy and photons, uh, sunlight, can be directly converted into electricity. Obviously, we do that. Uh, but through photosynthesis, uh, photons provide the energy that plants use uh, to make glucose. And, and just sort of reiterating what I've already said, just summarizing it, uh, so that uh, the plants uh, harvest light in their chloroplasts and do all this uh, stuff. So why study photosynthesis? Well, it should be obvious at this point, but anyway, because it manufactures glucose that contains our stored energy that makes life as we know it possible. Glucose is the basis for uh, uh, the versatile molecule cellulose, 
cellulose is is the most abundant natural product on earth uh it's uh it's the building block of um, of, of trees or all plants all all uh, um, grasses um, it's just it's just everywhere um and it also generates oxygen that enables us to release the chemical energy that's stored in glucose so it's crucial for life and it's very interesting chemistry complicated chemistry but interesting chemistry so we'll try to cover the origin and evolution of synthesis the chemistry of, of photosynthesis atp i will talk a lot about atp because that's important uh glucose starch and cellulose i mentioned them briefly but um uh, glucose is what plants make starch is 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 the way we normally transfer it around and, and start in cereals and so forth. And then cellulose, which is um, uh, not edible. And then food, and then oil, wood, fabrics, and so on. That's the whole, the whole gamut. All right, first we need to do with some basics. The Big Bang, the origin of the Earth, what is life? How and when did living things arrive on Earth? Where and uh, when and where did photosynthesis begin? I mean, it's, and look at sort of try to look at the history of it, uh, of history of, of, of the world, part one actually. Um, the Big Bang, 13.7 is 13.77 billion years ago, something like that. It's track two. Uh, GA means billion years ago. I will usually use the term BYA for billion years ago. Anyway, this is not a not a great slide, but it, it, it what it illustrates is that because the, the Big Bang is considered to be, have gone in all directions, uh, not just a, 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 a funnel like this. Uh, but anyway, the timing is such that uh, we began with climate, quantum fluctuations. Essentially, it was so hot that everything was plasma. Finally, that it, it began to, uh, to settle down into hydrogen. And uh, then stars formed 400 million years later. Um, I mean, the time frames are such that uh, we really can't sort of get a feel for them. Uh, but um, all of these things happen over long periods of time. So um, have to live with that. Uh, Big Bang expansion. And, and now we, we are up in here. Um, the Earth appeared uh, about 4.5 billion years ago. And it's it's assumed that uh, what happened was that uh, as the material from the Big Bang um, uh, spread, uh, some of it uh, cooled down, and then with the gravity, things stuck together to form um, stars. Uh, stars uh, then uh, had um, uh, fusion, uh, nuclear fusion within the center of the star, as as our sun does now. Uh, and the major thing that's happening there is, is hydrogen is forming into, into helium. And it eventually burns itself out and gets extremely hot. And, uh, and, that, and then you have fusion beyond going just from hydrogen to helium. You go to other things like carbon and, and, and higher, uh, uh, higher molecular weight, uh, higher atomic uh, mass uh, atoms. And uh, we on Earth have all kinds of uh, things like iron and calcium. And that those are assumed to have been generated in stars that were burning out, getting extremely hot, uh, fusing uh, into larger things, and, and then hitting the Earth. And so that's, that's how, they, how they got here. Um, this is all astrophysics that uh, we're not going to try to deal with today. So Earth, here we are. It's all these particles sort of amassed into, into Earth, it's slowly solidified over time, and eventually it's a nice bright blue um, Earth that we have here. So the major events uh, that, uh, that we need to deal with, the photosynthesis, the uh, generation of all kinds of bacteria, uh, amoeba, eventually animals and plants um, are on this sort of a, uh, this, this uh, arc 
Um, I, I'm not sure it's the, the best way to present this, but uh, uh, it does uh, show some of the things that I just talked about. Here's the Big Bang. Uh, the sun ignited uh, somewhere around, what is it, 5 billion uh, years, year, um, years ago. Uh, Earth formed here, the moon, and then we go on to first life, prokaryotes, photosynthesis, and so on. Uh, and you'll see this several times because it does show sort of in, 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 in pictorial form uh, the times at which various uh, uh, major events probably happened. Proximate time frame, Big Bang 13.7, Sun 4.6, Earth 4.5, First Life 3.8 billion years ago, so photosynthesis 3.5 billion years ago. Oxygenic photosynthesis, um, I'll, I'll describe this, I'll explain this in a minute. Animals and then plants. So um, we're pretty recent. So what is life? Um, because obviously the you know Earth when it was formed didn't have any didn't have didn't have any life. It was um, well there wasn't any anything living. So we need to sort of define what life is. Um, one of the really terrific books that uh, I, I've sort of and I'm going to give this to the to the library here, but it's a book by um, uh, Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan. Uh, Lynn Margulis was Carl Sagan's first wife, and uh, I'll mention her in a minute uh, or later in the talk. But it's a question of what is it's sort of a philosophical and scientific uh, uh, book and, and contains a lot of stuff um, that um, some of you may find interesting. But um, I've uh, thought about this for, and I think I've presented this uh, particular information previously at, at the ASP talk, but yes. You, you, you can use this, you, yeah, there, well, there's a mic if you'd like to, I, I'll, I'll, well, I can also just repeat the question, but here's a mic. You gave the cycle there and said that the animals came and then the plants came. Doesn't that seem strange that you would have animals before plants because plants are the source of oxygen for life? Well, plants that we're referring to green plants. Photosynthesis was going on for years and billions of years in, in uh, single cell organisms, prokaryotes, cyanobacteria, and so forth. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, all right, so um, what is life? Well, uh, you can you have to sort of think about it because nobody knows for sure what what the answer to this is. But uh, to be considered uh, alive, something must be cellular. It must it must separate itself from and this is everything happened in water early on. It has to separate itself from water because if it doesn't, it's just it's just all over the place. It has to be it has to be confined to a particular um, um, bag. Think think balloon. It has to be in sort of a balloon. Um, it has to be able to main, maintain order within these bound within within its boundaries within a cell wall or a membrane. And um, if it doesn't I mean the the this gets into some thermodynamics, but if it's if it's a closed system that is just totally shut off from anything outside, eventually it'll just fall apart. It'll just disintegrate uh, because of entropy. Uh, and I'm not going to try to explain entropy, but but it's it's I I sort of use the example of a garden. I mean, if you've got a garden completely closed off with a wall uh, and you don't do anything in it. It's going to fall into disrepair. I mean, it's not going to. You know, things will die, and and, and uh, weeds will come up, and so on. You need some outside influence to maintain order within that garden. By the same token, anything that's alive has to be able to use an outside source of energy uh, to maintain itself. So it has to be an open system. It has to have some some um, 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 some openings in it to pr pr provide. And, and the bottom line is that it brings in food 
uh, to, to, to metabolize food to maintain itself. Otherwise, it'll disintegrate. And it must be able to reproduce and mutate to permit it to evolve. Uh, because we know that whatever was first didn't stay that way. I mean, over time, I mean, we're, we're, we're here, we're living evidence of that. I mean, whatever that first cell had, it changed over time. And, and uh, uh, the, the concept that we use is evolution, which is natural selection of whatever it, it is. And so that to, to get there, you have to mutate. And what we have is DNA. DNA uh, is, is, um, is, is the instruction book for anything that's alive. And DNA, uh, when it, um, well, any chemical reaction uh, does not go to completion. And so uh, things change. And, um, and th these are, I, I would say, the uh, 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 absolute requirements for anything to be alive. The diversity of, of life is, is really uh, uh, absolutely astounding. This is sort of an aside. But uh, the, the, the diversity is, 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 is staggering. From archaea, archaea are, uh, there are actually three domains in life and living things on earth. There's archaea, there's, there's um, um, bacteria, and then there are eukaryotes. Uh, 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 eukaryotes, well, uh, archaea is something that we really don't think about much, although they're very uh, they're very small and very important. Anyway, the uh, the things that live on Earth range from things that are one cell, basically bacteria and archaea, uh, to trillions of cells. We we actually have trillions of cells. Um, there's some are photosynthetic; they can make their own glucose and so forth bacteria and so on and plants. Um, others are dependent on photosynthetic synthetic organisms. We are dependent on things that, uh, that do photosynthesis. Uh, what do all things, living things have in common? They need energy, food or sunlight. Uh, plants can use sunlight as their energy. We need food. And they, the, the focus of, of all of this work all of this photosynthesis is to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And I will go into that later. And they need to be able to use phosphate, ATP to do things. We do three, three things with, with ATP, we humans. We think, requires about a third of our ATP. We move, requires about a third. And we make things. We make our proteins, we make our DNA, and so forth. And I'll get into that later. Um, Okay, so the first living things on Earth. Well, we don't know what they were. Um, but they were probably tiny bacteria-like prokaryotes. Tiny means um, very small. Um, you need a microscope to see them. Uh, prokaryote means they don't have a real nucleus. They have DNA, but their nucleus is sort of scattered around throughout the cell. Uh, when they reproduce, they gather it all in the center. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's just a basic concept of biology. We are eukaryotes. E EU, the, it's a Greek uh, prefix meaning good or true. So we have a real, and, and karyot is nucleus. So we have a true nucleus, uh, but the first ones did not. Um, the evidence for them is uh, is found uh, in in uh, well, it, this is all uh, geochemistry or uh, pale, uh, paleontology combined with geochemistry. It's stuff that I really never really studied, but apparently the uh, people who study this uh, feel that the best evidence for these early prokaryotes has been found in Australian flint, also called chert. Uh, this is this is a quartz substance that apparently, if you look at it carefully, you can find evidence for fossils of these very early things. And it's known that this chert was formed uh, back way back when, three three point eight billion years uh, ago. 
Um, and that is really the, the, the only evidence that we have. I mean, this stuff is, is, is uh, soft uh, tissue, there's no bones, and so there are no, no real fossils. Uh, this is um, uh, the type of evidence that we rely on uh, to think that they uh, lived in, in, at this time. They lived in water. Um, uh, well, I guess there were some, you have to have moisture so that there has to, they have to be either in water or in, uh, in uh, moist areas. Where did they get their energy? Well, we're not sure about that either. There is some evidence or, or it is taught that there are these, uh, these uh, bubbles in the oceans that uh, generate um, um, plumes of hot water and uh, that this comes from some of the thermal energy uh, down in the, um, uh, in the center of the earth uh, and that perhaps they could harvest some of this. There's also uh, mechanisms whereby they can extract energy from from ions, um, just a, just one possibility is uh, iron ions. Iron exists as either ferrous uh, two two plus or ferric uh, three plus. And there's some evidence that there are living things that can extract that that energy between uh, one or the other. Um, But the first living things had to have some key molecules. Uh, for example, they had to have DNA, RNA, proteins, ATP. Um, we have no, no reasonable, no theories about how these things formed initially. And, but we're, we're pretty convinced that they couldn't have lived without uh, some basic uh, molecules of life. And so the, um, uh the uh well a lot of people have tried to figure out some uh some chain of events whereby the early molecules within the in the water uh could have become uh sort of by self assembly uh proteins or dna and so forth and um the one of the uh early experiments was done at the U university of chicago by uh, a graduate student named Stanley Miller and a uh, Nobel laureate physicist named Harold Urey. And they, they took some uh, stuff that they thought was probably on earth early on, methane, um, um, the hydrogen uh, uh, um, gas, um, uh, carbon dioxide, um, uh, some, some other perhaps, well, hydrocarbons, uh, but th that would, uh, that were floating around that, 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 um, uh, are, that form naturally because of the effect of, um, of sunlight and ultraviolet, well, particular UV radiation, uh, probably photo, uh, radioactivity on these molecules. And so they mix them in, in a, in a jar and, 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 uh, um, uh, sterilized things so they didn't have any bacteria, uh, but they, they exposed this then to intense light, uh, some heat, um, some uh, ultraviolet radiation. And after a while, they, they tested to see what's there. And they did find some what are called amino acids. Now, amino acids are the building blocks for our protein molecules. And um, uh, we we can make many of them, some of them we need to have in our diet, but they're absolutely essential for life. Uh, and they, they, they found that these occur, that they appear naturally uh, under conditions that may have existed uh, in the early earth. Now that's a long step from just having amino acids to saying we have protein molecules that can serve as enzymes to make DNA. I mean, it's a huge step. But we don't really have any other theories about this. Uh, the, the thing that we do have and that the early Earth had was time, hundreds of millions of years between uh, just the, the, the basic uh, uh, broth of, of, of Earth to, to, to the first life. So it's a huge step, but we have no way to know about anything other than that. There are some people who think that this that life may have come from outer space, 
and that's just a whole different argument that that changes the uh, the, the, the 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 discussion but if it came it did but did not do that it really had to be self assembly uh using molecules that form naturally and then um uh, became uh, functional uh, protein molecules. So after a few hundred million years, uh, there were these early prokaryotes. They, they, they lived, they were alive, we think. They probably multiplied very slowly, but they were alive. And, uh, and once you have something that's alive with DNA, it can mutate and keep changing and, and by selection uh, change and become more effective. So um, the, uh, after a, a few hundred million years, photosynthesis was invented. It was what's called anoxygenic. A, and the, a, again, A-N is, or A or A-N is, is a Latin prefix meaning without. So this did not produce oxygen, the first photosynthesis. Uh, it, it used carbon dioxide so it could make, um, make glucose, uh, but it did not um, produce oxygen. About a billion years later, some cells learn how to use water. Well, and, and as I'll explain later, when we get into some serious uh, physical chemistry, they need a proton and electron source uh, to make glucose. And the assumption is that they used hydrogen sulfide. Now, one reason for thinking that is that uh, there are even now some uh, anaerobic, there are some uh, plants that did not really change. Uh, and, and as I explained, there's, a, there's an amazing diversity of, um, of life that, that can do all kinds of things. And there are still some that live on hydrogen sulfide and live very happily. Uh, and we think that that's really what the early one, the, 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 the chemical reason is that it's easier to extract the hydrogen from hydrogen sulfide than it is from water. In any case, uh, about a billion years later, some cells learn to use water instead of hydrogen sulfide as their proton electron source. And these cells released oxygen. They performed modern oxygenic photosynthesis, um, we think several billion years ago. And we're going to look at the detailed chemistry of these reactions later, but uh, right now we're just going to um, look at the time frame again. Um, let's do that on this side here. We think that uh, anoxygenic photosynthesis uh, began somewhere around in here. First, we had the prokaryotes, the, the very first uh, organisms, um, little balloon like things that uh, could live on. Um, on what was around, then photosynthesis uh, without producing of oxygen, production of oxygen. And then somewhere in here, uh, atmospheric oxygen, uh, um, um, photosynthesis that produced oxygen. Uh, so, um, the first oxygenic bacteria, that first bacteria that produced oxygen, released oxygen. We think uh, somewhere around 2.4 to 2.8 billion years ago that they lived in water, that they used energy from sunlight, they produced glucose, and they released oxygen. Uh, some were called cyanobacteria. We'll, we'll talk a lot about cyanobacteria later. Uh, it's also called blue-green algae, but it's technically a bacterium, not an algae. And cyanor just refers to the color. It's, it's bluish-green. Uh, <clears throat> so, the early atmosphere. Uh, what, what was the atmosphere in which these uh, animals lived? We really don't know for sure what the composition of the air near the surface of the Earth was at that time. Apparently, the Earth, uh, the atmosphere of the Earth changed occasionally over the years, um, but it likely included carbon dioxide, methane, uh, they are both strong greenhouse gases. And so the presence of, um, of, um, 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 of them in the, in the atmosphere helped to, make, to keep the heat from the, uh, from the sun 
uh, on on Earth. But now we're, we're we're worried about greenhouse gases making it too hot. But way back then, it was absolutely essential that these greenhouse gases existed. Otherwise, the Earth would be extremely cold. Uh, we think that the Earth was sometimes warm uh, because of these greenhouse gases, and it was sometimes a snowball. There's good evidence that sometimes it, the Earth got very cold. Uh, you know, whether the uh, carbon dioxide, um, well, we don't know the, ba the basis for that. Uh, it seems that it should have been warm all the time with the carbon dioxide and, and methane, but uh, there's evidence that it was a snowball at times. Uh, op, but oxygen generated by photosynthesis was being released into the oceans and the atmosphere. And a graph of the estimated atmospheric oxygen is on the next slide. Now, this slide is 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 one that I that I like because it's 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 informative, but you have to have to look at it a few times to really see what what we're trying to say. Uh, so anoxygenic photosynthesis, no oxygen, uh, we think began around 3.5 billion years ago. On this graph, that's right about in here. This is the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere. And this is the time. And GA is billions of years ago. So this is now, it's a billion years ago, two, three, three point eight. And so we think the anoxygenic photosynthesis began around here. And that, uh, the, and that uh, oxygenic photosynthesis began around uh, in this region, right around here where this line is. So between 3.8 and 2.8 billion years ago, atmospheric oxygen remained pretty much near zero. And, and I just say uh, parenthetically here that, that oxygen is an extremely abundant element on Earth, but it's almost all locked up. It's, it's, it's in, it's in uh, um, um, many rocks are, 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 um, are oxides. Uh, or they, they, silicon, I mean, sand is all silicon dioxide. Um, rocks are, are, um, are containing a lot of oxygen, but it's not free oxygen. We can't, you, we can't breathe it. So all this oxygen was tied up. Uh, but uh, with the oxygen being produced by oxygenic photosynthesis, perhaps 400 million years, most of this oxygen reacted with iron that was dissolved in the ocean. Now there was a lot of iron in the ocean uh, ferrous oxide, uh, uh, ferrous uh, iron, and ferric iron, um, and that's during this. That's this period in here. We think the, again, the we think ox the, the that the oxygen release began right around here on this curve, three two point eight billion years ago, but that for a long time there was no change in the oxygen in the atmosphere. Now, why was that? Well, we think it's because the oxygen was being tied up, but it was reacting with the iron in the oceans. And the evidence for that is uh, Grand Canyon or uh, these uh, uh, banded iron uh, formations. This is in Western Australia. Uh, there are, th these, these red lines are uh, ferric oxide, they're, they're rust. The, the, the rusting of the of the of the oceans, and so oh, this was all underwater at that time, and so we think that this iron sort of settled and formed a band. Now there are red bands, and then there are bands that don't have uh, any iron, and and the explanation for that is that, um, um, well, this goes back a little bit further. That there were times when the when the Earth became very cold. And so that the bacteria just didn't produce much. I mean, this is a heat de uh, temperature dependent reaction. So that the plants did not um, um, uh, produce much oxygen and therefore this, the, th the settling to the, to the bottom of the earth did not contain uh, any, any rust. But then things turned around and this is over billions of years, uh, over million, hundreds of millions of years that, uh, that, that rust was being produced, it settled and then without rust and so on. We think that's the basis for these, uh, for these bands. Anyway, uh, this then would be this period of time here. We're producing oxygen, but it doesn't appear in the, in the atmosphere. 
because it's all being tied up by, by the iron. And then for starting from this point, uh, it's it sort of saturated. It's saturated the uh, the uh, it's it's rusted all the iron in the in the oceans. So now it slowly builds up. Uh, the bacteria uh, are the the, the oxygenic uh, organisms are building up. So it builds up to this point here, and uh, and then it remains constant. Now it's it's not clear why why this why these all changes take place but this particular part which i find really interesting is um is explained as i as i just said and this is one more this is our last look at this slide but again it sort of summarizes things uh the earliest cellular life back here um the and then the anox then the the back the photosynthetic organisms that did not produce uh, oxygen then from here on, oxygen is being produced, but it's being tied up in by the uh, by the iron, and then um, uh, then uh, oxygen begins to build up in the atmosphere. At that point, there were plenty of of um, anaerobic, uh, and there was plenty of life going on, but it didn't use oxygen, and that's called anaerobic oxygen. They they did not use oxygen, so these existed. But once the uh, once the oxygen appeared, that that's basically a poison. For these um, uh, anaerobic bacteria, anaerobic organisms, and so a lot of them died off. There's a huge die off at this point. Um, but the oxygen had the other effect, and that was to 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 facilitate the um, the development of, uh, of of the things that could use oxygen. And so we got multicellular uh, organisms, and that leads into plants and animals, and so on. Um, so there's plenty of oxygen here and and then at this point it goes back up uh, we'll talk about that later any questions about that slide i've shown that several times and and uh, i find it fascinating to see the 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 juxtaposition of the of the, the chemistry with the geology and the, the laying down of all these um, iron formations question here first how do you have water without oxygen Water existed uh, on Earth uh, all this time. It's it's not clear where the water came from. That's part of the oxygen that I mentioned. That's very abundant on Earth. It's tied up in water okay. or in rocks. So it was there, so, but it wasn't in, in the we think, atmosphere, basically, or some. Time. Well, there was water in the atmosphere, yes, but it's it's not usable. Uh, but the oxygen is is very tightly bound to the hydrogen. That's the point okay. of photosynthesis. We'll get into that a little right. later. later. Um, but where did that water come from? Well, there are various theories. One is that comets brought water to the earth. Uh, we, in fact, we do not know where the water came from, but, but water, oxygen, the earth had a lot of water all this time. This, this event, what, do you think that was a, a chemical event or was it, um, uh, solar, the, the, that all of a sudden the oxygen somehow or other escaped from the iron. I'll get into that later. The, the, the uh, oxygen was being released from water by photosynthesis. But I need to, you need to give me a few more slides to, to explain this. I mean, we're not quite there yet. It's chemistry and some people are afraid of chemistry. So I'll try to ease that fear. The red line in the graph is oxygen. Yes. And what is the green line? I don't know. Oh, actually, I do know. It's an other estimate of the levels. The, the levels of, of, of oxygen, how do we know what the level of oxygen was back then? Well, I, you know, there, there are a couple of ways to get answers in, in 2023. Uh, one is to go to Google, and the other is to ask Siri. Uh, they, they both they both have a lot of answers. Well, the answer to the um, how do we know the oxygen levels in early times? Apparently, the technique used is mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes, abbreviated MIF. And uh, uh, it's um, there may be geologists in the uh, there's at least one geologist in the, in the audience here who may know what this is all about. But I don't, I, apparently it's related to the same techniques that are used to use carbon dating 
for uh, age of, of, of carbon things. It, de it deals with the, with the uh, uh, isotopes of sulfur, but I do not know, uh, I cannot uh, explain that to you. But that's one of the techniques used to estimate the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere at various points in time. Best I can do, sorry. That's the next HASP class, isotopes <laughs> of sulfur. MIS, yes. I don't think so. Um, okay, so who produced all this oxygen? Phytoplankton. Okay, now phytoplankton is a term that uh, I've run into in the past talking about, uh, say, uh, where whales get their food. Well, whales eat krill, and krill eat phytoplankton. And so phytoplankton are the basic, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the basic entity in the food chain in oceans, okay? So what are phytoplankton? Well, uh, they're diverse, photosynthetic, unicellular organisms. They lived in the water, they still do, and produce half of Earth's oxygen. And we think oxygen comes from all these plants. Well, apparently half of, of the oxygen produced on Earth is made by, is released by um, phytoplankton. Uh, so they produce, they, they make oxygen, they produce glucose, they provide food and oxygen for things that live in the water. Now, there, th th this picture is, is not a great picture, but it shows all these different shaped things. And apparently there are hundreds of millions. Let me see, what does this say? How many are there on Earth? A billion, billion, billion individual phytoplankton. And that's sort of estimated by measuring the amount, the number of phytoplankton in a, in a kilo, in a liter of, of water and then and so forth. A um, hundred thousand different species of phytoplankton. What's the definition of phytoplankton? It's a single cell organism that lives in the water and produces and, and does photosynthesis. So it, it's, it's a hugely diverse um, um, term, a, a term that, 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 that describes, describes a, a lot of different things. So uh, that's, that's sort of um, um, the, the introduction to, um, to what we're gonna talk about, uh, the evolution of plants and animals, um, endosymbiosis is a uh, is a key term. Now, I, I don't uh, generally like to drop names, but um, the person who um, who came up with the concept recently, I mean, it, it was really originally uh, um, written about by a Russian. I I don't have his name written down. Back in the early 1900s, endosymbiosis. But it was picked up by a woman named Lynn Margulis. Is her name up there? Not quite yet. Um, anyway, she um, she was uh, Carl Sagan's first wife. Uh, she's uh, um, she was a, a professor at Boston University. She she died about ten years ago, I guess. She was a, been a professor at at um, University of um, Massachusetts, uh, but. She was at, at Boston University in, in, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, I arrived in Boston in, in um, 1967, uh, take a job there but, uh, at Harvard. And um, uh, she was living in, in, in Lexington. She, she and Carl Sagan were originally divorced, uh, but she was living there in Lexington with uh, her three children. And, and we were living in Winchester. And, and one of her neighbors was Sam Lehrer, who was a colleague of mine in, at the laboratory I was in, in in Boston. And so apparently they got to talking and she was, she had this crazy idea and she was trying to talk to everybody who knew anything about biology about it. So apparently Sam mentioned that I was uh, a new uh, guy from uh, Brookhaven and uh, maybe I had some ideas. So they, she, they arranged a lunch uh, at, at Boston University. So. Lynn Margulis and I had lunch, and she uh, she wanted to bounce this off off me. She was you know, not that I was 
anything particularly special, but I was I was a new guy in town and uh, maybe had some thoughts on it. So I didn't really understand uh, fully the concept that she was talking about, but we did have a nice, uh, uh, pleasant lunch and and talk about annual endo um, symbiosis. So the 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 theory really is um, sort of illustrated here. It'll be on this slide and then the next slide. Uh, life continued to evolve. Uh, this is uh, this is on the order of um, a million and a half, a billion and a half years ago, and some of the larger unicellular organisms that were precursors of animals acquired mitochondria from bacteria. Uh, other precursors, others that were precursors of plants, acquired both mitochondria and chloroplasts from cyan from cyanobacteria. The chloroplasts from cyanobacteria. The mechanism was probably endosymbiosis. And that's illustrated here where this is a this is a unicellular organism, but it's a big one. And this is a small um, um, aerobic pro prokaryote. It, it, and, and it gets engulfed. I mean, this guy eats this one and it gets stuck inside and somehow it, it continues to grow. And then a later one gets a photosynthetic protokaryote. And so this guy ends up with both of them. Uh, so this would be a precursor for an for the animal cells. This is a precursor for a plant cell. And this shows it a little bit uh, differently here. We start out with a, with a plant, with a cell that has DNA inside, a membrane, uh, then it gets an ancestral prokaryote, a very early kind of thing. It swallows it. Um, here, and becomes an animal cell. And this one has this and a, a photosynthetic cell, and it becomes an ancestor to a plant cell. Now, the, the evidence, and this is the kind of thing that, that wouldn't be very common because typically the, the, the big cell eats the small cell and chews it up and then uses the, the parts to just the way we use a Cheerios or whatever. Um, but uh, the theory is that some of them actually stayed there and living, living. Some of the extra stuff got released, got gotten rid of, but the, the, the nucleus, the, the part of it that, that could produce, that could work like a mitochondria, mitochondria actually are the ones that process food, um, that, that they stayed in the cell. And that made it a much more powerful cell, a cell able to, to, to process energy much more effectively. And then, of course, anything that got the, 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 um, the, the um, photosynthetic thing could become a plant and make and do photosynthesis. So, um, The next slide says this is a good time for questions or comments. Uh, but the uh, this concept of of endo of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, the, the the major supporting evidence for that. Let me just go back here to that one more time. The major uh, evidence supporting this concept is that um, this cell has its own nucleus, right? And, and if it's gonna multiply, it's going to duplicate this DNA. I mean, we've talked about this before, how, how cells divide and so on. They have to make a whole new set of, of, of DNA. Well, the mitochondrion, these things here, have their own DNA. They don't depend on the DNA from the parent cell. They depend on the DNA within the mitochondria. And uh, so when a plant divide, when a cell divides, when our cells divide, we have DNA in the, in the, in the major cell that duplicates and, and goes forward. But we also have mitochondria. Each of our cells, like our heart cells, have like 2,000 mitochondria in them. As, as a heart cell has to duplicate, the, the duplication of the mitochondrion is done by using the DNA in the mitochondria. 
And this, the another implication of that is that the uh, in 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 human fertilization, you have a sperm and an egg. The sperm has almost no mitochondria. They have a few mitochondria for their own uh, use while they're floating around, swimming around. But this the the egg is full of mitochondria, and those are the mitochondria that we um, receive in in our zygote, in our whatever we grow up to be, and that comes from our mother. And so there, it's possible to trace the the the, the genealogy of uh, the molecular genealogy of humans or other any animals through mitochondria, but that goes through the mother's line. And 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 it's 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 done using the same sort of technology that police use to uh, uh, to identify um, criminals and you know using DNA technology. It's not exactly the same, but but it's it's analogous. So th that's a, that's that's through the maternal line because the mitochondria have their own DNA and they are in the egg and we get that from our mother. Would that also be the case with plants? No, no, plants do not do the, do, they don't, I'm not gonna go into, the question is, do, does this also apply to plants? And it does not, uh, and, and I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. One of the major differences between plants and animals is that we have this reproductive system through sperm and eggs. Plants have a variety of, of, of reproductive mechanisms, through spores and, and uh, um, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, we can have a course on botany at some point if you want to. But um, no, it's different. So there we are. Good time for questions and comments. Uh, you want to wait, wait for the microphone, maybe? Give Gordon a little exercise here. Are the uh, phytoplankton that you mentioned, are they prokaryotes or eukaryotes? Like they're, um, I, I think they're probably both. I, I'm not certain about that. There are certainly single cell animals that are that are eukaryotes. I, I assume they're both. The previous slide showed uh, the capability for um, photosynthesis existing before plants. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's the phytoplankton or Cyano, cyanobacteria are are the major uh, things that and and plankton many of them are, cyto, are cyanobacteria and and uh, that simply means that these are organisms that have a um, uh, and, and there are hundreds of different species of cyanobacteria uh, but they're a particular color. And they do photosynthesis very well, and they are eukaryotes. Uh, this is a little outside of that. I'm just wondering what is the dark cycle of the Earth going around? You know, when we have the dark cycle of our rotation, is that critical to where we are? Or could we always have that the full light? Is there a, a significance in the dark cycle of our? Uh, You're referring to, to to the daily cycle, yeah. night versus dark. The fact that you have a period of, of inactivity. Right. There's a part of photosynthesis that requires sunlight, so it does not occur at night. The other half can occur in either light or dark. I'll, I'll go into that specifically that's a very good question but i will go into that but yes it absolutely requires sunlight to do photosynthesis that's for the first step to make atp second step to make glucose can be done either light or dark could you go back to the slide with the growth of oxygen please on the slides you showed in a graph here we go um there's speculation, maybe stronger than that, that an asteroid hit the planet at about 200 million years old. Any, is that a coincidence that there was a lot more oxygen about that time? I don't know. Um, probably, but, but because the oxygen at that point 
was um, it was pretty constant. Um, you're, you're talking, you're putting it right around here, right? I'll look right it to the right. Here you go. Yeah. No, uh, the oxygen level has been there. there this jump here, which is uh, apparently unexplained, but but it, it notice it jumps to about twenty percent here, and it's remained at constant constant at 20 percent for years for half a billion years um I, i'm not aware of any effect of asteroids on the oxygen other, other than um reduced photosynthesis because there was such a cloud cover for so many years yeah that's certainly um but i think that the number of years is probably small relative to the what number of years we're talking about here? It was long enough to kill the the, the dinosaurs and, and and most large animals uh, after you know when the, when the dinosaur asteroid hit. Um, I'm not familiar with the one that you're talking about at 200 billion years ago, but the one that would have created the Gulf of Mexico. Well, I think that was later. I think that I, mean, that, I think that's the 60 68 seven or million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs? I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, I'm not familiar with the effect on the oxygen levels. Yes. Uh, yeah, Marshall, going back to your slide that you showed of the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge, there aren't any banded iron formations in the canyon. Boy, they look, yeah. they what, look cute. Um, it, it, what you're looking at there would be very much younger rocks, okay. Paleozoic and Mesozoic, and the okay. banded iron formations would be pre-Cambrian or before the Cambrian right. explosion. Okay. Um, okay. They would be way down in the bottom of the canyon. Um, the, um, the, you know, the colors you see certainly are due to oxidation of any iron-bearing minerals that are in the canyon. Okay. But the yeah the, the closer spot to see banded iron formations would be the of course the Upper Peninsula. Mm -hmm. If you go up to Nagani, there's a, a very famous outcrop up there. Thank you. Right, so this is the one we need to look at. Scratch the other one. Any other comments? All right, so now we get into some serious stuff. <laughs> uh, so plants and animals, uh, here we go back to this thing here, plants, when did plants appear here? Sponges, of course, are animals. Plants, uh, plants didn't actually make this, but uh, it's around this time. Of course, this, this is not to, to, to scale. Um, but um, animals and plants. Animal, what's the definition of an animal? Well, um, there's no simple answer, I guess. The first animals did not look like us. Uh, animals are multicellular. They do not do photosynthesis. And they have novel reproductive systems that include um, uh, ova and sperm. Um, mitochondria enable them to use glucose-based food and oxygen efficiently. And the first animals appeared on Earth around 800. Now they're just, they're just if you look at the pictures of, of, of what's considered an animal, it's, 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 it's just not obvious. I mean, it, we didn't go from, from nothing to worms, for example. There are intermediates that um, uh, by, and this is these things are, are defined really by the biochemistry of them. Um, how they, you know, the biochemistry of reproduction, biochemistry of their respiration and so on. And green plants uh, probably evolved from green algae. Um, and this is a type of uh, bacterium. Uh, and most plants retain the ability to carry out photosynthesis. Uh, the reproductive systems are different from those of animals. Most plants use glucose-based food for energy and plants came up onto land about 500 million years ago. I mean, plants were in, in, in the ocean. Uh, phytoplankton are, many of them are plants. And so, um, again, the definition is, is problematic uh, for me at least, um, but um, plants and animals did diverge. And then modern times, last billion years or so, 
plenty of sunlight, plenty of carbon dioxide, water. Plants covered the earth more and more once they came on, line, on land. Consumed oxygen, produced, uh, consumed carbon dioxide, produced oxygen and glucose. Animals thrived with plenty of food. They could eat plants and they could eat each other and plenty of oxygen. And phytoplankton made the oxygen and glucose for marine animals. So, so green plants are on, on land to produce oxygen and glucose. Phytoplankton, I, I showed these before, uh, made the oxygen and glucose for marine animals. It's it's assumed and, and uh, trying to figure out the the the, the ratios here and and the, the uh, ratios in the literature range from about uh, forty percent to about eighty percent, and nobody knows for sure uh, what the ratio is. But uh, certainly, phytoplankton, things that live in the water, uh, produce at least half of the oxygen on Earth, and so a broad overview now, this, this is a little bit complicated, but I just, it makes a point that I, that I want, to, want, to, want to make. Uh, plants versus animals. Plants, photosynthetic bacteria and phytoplankton and so on, these things are photogenic. Step one, their energy source is sunlight. The product, what do they make? They make ATP. Um, I'll get into that in, in more detail. Um, they, what do they use that ATP for? They use it to make glucose. That's all they do. Photosynthesis uses sunlight to make ATP. And then in the second stage, they use ATP to make glucose. What is the energy source for, um, for plants to, to take care of their own needs? Well, they use glucose. They use the glucose that they make by photosynthesis to, uh, to, to, to do their own work, to, 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 to make um, their, their, their bodies. And um, uh, well, their, their energy source is glucose, they, they produce ATP. Now this is not the same ATP as here. Uh, photosynthesis produces ATP and then plants using glucose make ATP. And what do they use that ATP for? To build themselves. Uh, they have energy needs to, to grow their roots, to do, to do things within plants. They, they, use, they have energy needs just like we do. So they use ATP that comes from metabolizing their own glucose. Animals, our energy source is glucose or fat or protein. The fat or protein comes from glucose because animals eat plants and then animals make meat or fat and we eat that and what is our uh product what do we use this glucose or fat or protein for to make atp what do we use our atp for whatever we need to do we move we think and make, we make things um i don't know maybe it's intuitively obvious but but i i, I think this is helpful to me to see that plants do both. They make the glucose and they use the glucose. Animals only use the glucose. So plants, no, we need plants. All right, now for some chemistry. Uh, Bob will like this. We had organic chemistry together way back in the, in the day. Um, and chem organic chemistry is fun. I mean, they separate, see, sometimes say they, that, photo, that organic chemistry and calculus separate the, from the um, girls from the women or the men from the boys. Uh, but um, uh, chemistry is, organic chemistry is a lot of fun. You draw all these pictures of things. I mean, basically this is what's in your sugar bowl. Actually, when your sugar bowl is sucrose, not glucose. Sucrose is, is, is two of these put together, it's actually glucose plus fructose makes sucrose. Um, but um, it's um, what we eat every day. Glucose has six carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. And actually, that can be drawn. Well, and it has uh, six oxygen atoms, the red things, and 12 hydrogens, uh, the H's. The glucose molecule made by plants can be linear or circular. And this is, this is either interchangeable. Uh, we can use them either way. Uh, so here it's gone circular 
and this is linear. Um, and it's D not L. Um, D glucose, me, D means dextro levatory. Uh, dextro, is that the right word? Uh, anyway, it rotates um, polarized light in the right direction. Uh, dextro is, is right in, in, in Latin. And levo, L is for levo, that's left. And um, uh, the, the difference between the two is in this particular uh, carbon, where if this oxygen is on the other side, it's L. If the oxygen is on this side, it's D. And um, we can metabolize um, uh, D, but we cannot metabolize L. L is, is rare in, in, in nature. Plants make uh, L glucose. Uh, I'm sorry, D glucose, and we eat and use D glucose. Okay, you can make L glucose for various, actually, you make it in the lab, you get a mixture of the two. Um, and then there's also the alpha versus beta. Uh, the alpha, and that is determined by, in this picture at least, by whether the uh, this oxygen is on the bottom or the top. Um, and the important thing is that the alpha form, uh, this, this one here, when it's polymerized, when it, when it combines with other alphas, it makes starch, or in, 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 in us, it makes uh, glycogen. I'm not really gonna talk much about glycogen, but uh, they're both uh, ways that these are polymerized, that you take identical units and tie them all together uh, to make, um, uh, to make um, um, starch. And the beta form, this one here, uh, when you, when you uh, hook these together, they make cellulose. And uh, that's a big deal, um, but it's almost 11 o'clock. So I'm going to stop at that point. Um, cellulose is, um, as I said, the most abundant uh, um, chemical uh, molecule on earth and um, starch, um, glucose is what keeps us alive. Any more additional questions, comments? Right here. So am I correct in understanding you that starch is nothing more than polymerized A, D, glucose? Yes. Thank you. I mean, they get cross-linked and so on. So that wood is 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 uh, both cellulose and lignin to hold things together. But it's it's almost all a potato, for example, is is ninety percent uh, starch, uh, whereas cotton fibers are ninety percent cellulose. They're chemically identical. I mean, uh, they're just you put you, you test them in a lab and you get the same CHO content but they are very different in terms of our ability and biological systems to use them. Yes, sir. We generally separate plants and animals. Is there any indication that there was a transitional organism that included characteristics of both? I'm thinking- Well, there are no, there are no photosynthetic animals. I mean, in principle, uh, there's really no good reason why we couldn't all be green and be be, be using be using oxygen Here from outer space. <laughs> if, if we had if, if we had by endo and by by endo bio uh, whatever that was uh, as taken plas plasmids into our, our our skin, but we didn't. Were there were there plants that actually moved though? I mean, animals move, plants use the. Well, was it the Venus flytrap? Doesn't that? trap things and, uh, but 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 actually that that gets into to, to my specialty which was which was muscles muscle proteins and and uh, there are and my specialty was actin the structure of actin which is a major one of the major 
proteins on Earth as, as well. But it and there is some and it's a cytoskeleton. It, it both in muscle and in the skeleton of the cell itself to sort of hold it together. And um, uh, they're, they're they're related. They're related. I mean, we go back way back when, but um, they're not the same. Um, uh, so the answer, I guess, would be no. There are no animals, that, plants that I know of that can walk around, do things. Anything else? You have five minutes, four minutes yet. Any from outer space? Any from outer space? No. Uh, Saved by the bill. <laughs> I just looked. I just looked up cyanobacteria, and they are not eukaryotes, as you had said. Mm -hmm. So, so the there's uh, a huge diversity of cyanoplankton are both, as you said. Yeah, it, it's 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 cyanobacteria is a is a is almost a generic term for hundreds and maybe thousands of different genuses, and so. Um, Oh. Uh oh. Just for fun, why don't you mention uh, actin and myosin? Okay. That, that's next time. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about about how act how how uh, ATP is used within within the heart, for example. Okay. I always liked it when class got out early, Marshall. <laughs> so thank you very much. And we'll see.